Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Matt, for that uh, very uh, clear and very interesting talk. Um, not just about the coronavirus, but of course, how this is just one part of something which fits into uh, a whole series of events that uh, have happened to the world, which God has been uh, in control of. Um, and uh, you know, th those of us who've uh, been studying our scriptures can, can see how uh, everything is under God's control. And uh, many people are worried right now, but uh, can, can those people see. who trust in God have no fear in that sense. So uh, there's, uh, there's great comfort to be taken from what you've had to say tonight. Uh, thanks again for that, Brother Matt. Um, stay with us uh, if you're still online and listening in. Um, I'm going to go through a few messages and a couple of questions that we've uh, picked up via a, a couple of channels uh, on YouTube that the talk's gone um, across to people uh, this evening. Uh, I'm going to go through the, the, the Q&A uh, in the chat as well. But um, just before we get into our Q&A, and uh, I hope you're able to um, put some questions there as, as, we're, as we're continuing to broadcast right now. Um, before we get into that, I'm just going to uh, conclude our, our meeting formally with, uh, with a word of prayer. Almighty Heavenly Father, great God of all creation, God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who through we have hope of salvation and life eternal by thy grace, Lord. We thank thee that we are able to have the health and strength and the willingness and the desire to meet together and connect with each other in this way this night. To also, Lord, be able to open thy word freely and read it in our own language and try and learn a little bit more of thy plan and purpose. Lord God, thou hast recorded thy word and thy dealings with thy people, Israel, indeed with all the nations of the earth throughout human history in thy word. And Father, we marvel that all the things that thou hast said in thy word have come true and are coming true and indeed will come to be true in the near future. Every word that thou hast spoken will come to pass, for thou art the great God of all creation and thy power and thy strength is beyond our comprehension and thy power and thy greatness has the strength to make all these things happen which thou hast said. And so, Lord God, we thank thee for the Lord Jesus. We thank thee for the hope of salvation we have through his saving name. Help us to consider our ways before thee, whether we have accepted him in the waters of baptism or not. Help us to walk lives which are right and pleasing before thee. And those who have not yet committed their lives to thee, help them, Lord, to consider carefully how they are going to respond to the call of the gospel. So, Father, we thank thee for our time together. We commend our meeting into thy loving hands and ask for thy blessing and for thy forgiveness this night. All these things we ask through the name of the future king of the whole world, even the Lord Jesus Christ, for whose return we urgently pray. Amen. Okay, well, thanks again to uh, Brother Matt for your talk tonight. Um, we've uh, gone out on a couple of channels on YouTube tonight, as well as on Zoom and as well as on Facebook. And uh, I think we had about 80 people on one channel on um, YouTube and another 30 on another channel, uh, plus the 100 or so here on, on Zoom. Um, and, of course, every connect that's just connections. There's obviously more than one person in, in many places uh, uh, logging in and, and listening in tonight. Uh, we've had uh, a couple of messages from uh, various places around the world, actually. We've had uh, a message from uh, a couple of messages from India. Uh, we've had a message from Ghana, uh, from uh, Livonia, which I believe is Detroit in the USA, uh, and also from Mexico. So, uh, well, it's lovely that you could all join us. Thank you. Yeah, excellent. Um, I'm just going to try and go through. Um, uh, the, uh, the the Q and A panel on the, on the screen here. See if I can pick up any questions. Uh, most of them are all people you might know and are just getting in touch and saying hello. Um, uh, we, I've got one question. I'll come on to a bit, but um, a, a couple of questions have been quite general, asking about how um, um, how how the UK is um, dealing with the coronavirus crisis right now. So. Um, we had a message from somebody in India right now just asking about uh, generally 
uh, how Britain is coping um, with. Uh, do you want me to do, you want me to do with that, Jared, a little bit? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll just, I'll just. I'm just trying to find the exact wording of the question. Uh, let me just go back a second. Uh, yeah, uh, somebody called Renison Christie. I don't know who that is, but uh, Renison Christie in India says, "How is the condition of your country?" about coronavirus uh, corona cases have increased in my country india well um i guess uh, it, it's probably the same i mean we i can't i think there's a lot of pain out there there's a lot of suffering we're all in lockdown there's been a lot of deaths um it's pretty miserable um from that perspective from a human perspective i think the government's struggling to know what to do in terms of how to let people out um the economy is uh, obviously tanking and so um, they're trying. I think, from what I can gather, anyway. Although I'm no expert, they're trying to they're trying to weigh up the economy, the cost to the economy, and then the cost to human life. And so, you know, that's that's the balance here. And so, yeah, it's 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 not great from that perspective. But as I say, we as believers, we have the uh, the peace that surpasseth all understanding, in the sense that we believe that God is in control and that God has a purpose with us. And so we we look for to Him, and we we are in awe of him and we are in prayer with, to him daily. And uh, a lot of Christadelphian meetings are still managing to meet like this on Zoom. It's not quite the same, but um, we're very blessed in that in that instance. And I think a lot of us are, are taking courage to spend time with our families where we can. But, you know, some people have got ill, obviously, and that's, that's, that's not great. And it reminds us of the state that we're in and the need we have for salvation in Christ. So I hope that kind of answers it, but it's probably pretty much the same. I mean, I work all over the world and um, uh, virtually at the moment. And, uh, you know, it's the same in, um, in, in, in pretty much all the countries I've been in touch with, America um, and so on. But one good thing that, that the British government has done, well, it seems good, is that they have um, said that they will uh, pay for a lot of people's uh, wages for a few months. And so I think that's taken a bit of pressure off. But of course, then that comes with consequences later down the line. So we don't know what that, that means yet. So I hope that answers the question. But hello to India, by the way. Yeah, I think in Britain, I think the death toll, sadly, is around the 16,000 mark. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head what the uh, the number of infections are. Um, of course, infections don't necessarily mean you've got symptoms as well. But uh, one thing that certainly uh, struck me recently is it doesn't matter how good your health system is or how advanced your health care is, whether it's private or public, you know, whatever nation in the world, uh, this has stretched every healthcare system to its absolute limit. Uh, I mean, in Britain, there's been um, uh, a a rapid increase in trying to build new hospitals, that sort of thing. So everybody has been really tested really quite sorely. Yeah, it's it's not great. It's not great at all. Um, Yeah. Um, I'm just going to throw in uh, a a, a Bible reference. I noticed about three quarters of the way in, Matt, there, you said we haven't had many references, so I'm uh, I'm going to throw (laughs) one in if I may. Uh, Yeah, please do. When I uh, say we haven't had many references, I meant ones that we hadn't turned to. We've obviously put packed loads in, so uh, let's turn to one. Take us to one. Yeah, so uh, Leviticus 11. Um, So we have here uh, in Leviticus 11, um, Obviously, uh, God giving uh, the law to the Jews in ancient times. And uh, verse 1 of Leviticus 11, uh, it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, saying unto them, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, These are the beasts which ye shall eat among all the beasts that are on the earth. And then the the, the animals are listed there. Uh, Then if you go to verse 13 of uh, Leviticus chapter 11, And these are they which ye shall have in abomination. Among the fowls, they are not to be eaten. They are an abomination. And then it's the list. It's the eagle, the ossifrage, and the osprey. And then you get down to verse 19. What does it say? And the stork, the heron, after her kind, and the lapwing, and the bat. Uh, So God has made very clear, as you said in your talk, you know, God is a God of truth. Uh, God tells it exactly how it is. And God told the Jews in ancient times what they can, what they couldn't eat and what was acceptable and edible and what was disgusting and abominable. And there it is in black and white. You know, the bat was there listed as uh, something that was not to be eaten. Um, sadly, that message didn't get around uh, to all parts of the world, even though this, you know, the, the word of God, I'm sure, has been translated into Mandarin, into Chinese and all the other dialects, so many of them. Uh, but it would appear that that uh, that is the cause of the problem where we are today. Yeah, I think that's 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 really really interesting. I think another um, interesting passage, if I can go there, Jared, is um, yeah. you know is is in Daniel chapter twelve, right? Because 
one of the issues of this uh, this virus, like you say, that they, they think it was um, spread by a bat, um, is that it, it spread because of people traveling, right? And um, in Daniel chapter 12, we read of the time of the end that the traveling of humans is a thing that was is a hallmark of the time of the end, right? So in Daniel 12, and uh, and at verse uh, four, it says, "Thou Daniel." Shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. So this is his prophecy, right? He was to shut the book. And then it says, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. And so it would seem that the explosion of knowledge and the traveling back and forth, the hallmark of these times is, is also one of the problems that we've faced with the spread of coronavirus. So I think I just add that to the mix, that, yeah, we've, uh, we've not been listening to God's law, and then we've been spreading it all over the place. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that verse because it talks about how knowledge shall be increased. And, uh, you know, certainly in terms of information and data, that's certainly rapidly increased. However, it, that's not the same thing as wisdom. It's all very well having all this knowledge and information and data, but if you haven't got the wisdom to know what to do with it, it's not really of any advantage to you. Um, yeah, and, even, and even the knowledge that we have got, we haven't got a cure to this virus, have we? So, you know, it's it really has leveled everything, like you were saying, like, you know, right from all classes of society. Um, all health services are at, at breaking point. And, uh, yeah, it's uh, it just shows how weak actually we are, you know, and I think that's a scary thought for a lot of people. And so, uh, you know, I hope the message for tonight was was helpful. Yeah. Um, I, think you, I think you're right. Um, you know, a lot of the world are quite obsessed with quick, let's develop a vaccine, quick, let's, let's develop a cure. So man is very much uh, obsessed with, with medicine and, and trying to create a cure because he thinks he's clever enough and has the technology and the ability to, to come up with the cure. Well, mm. coming up with the cure isn't the answer. The answer is not to eat bats in the first place. You know, prevention yeah. is, it, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, prevention. And, and even if, and even if they come up with the cure, right, which, you know, hopefully they will. And, you know, Christadelphians will be, we'll, we, we'd love it. You know, we're, we're not, we're not um, anti-science in that sense, but the, the, the thing for us is that, you know, it doesn't solve the root problem, which is, sin and death we're still going to die right and that is really what the the hope of the bible is about is to is to solve that problem the root problem of all these diseases and problems and suffering in the world do we have any more uh jared yeah um there's one question that um i'm gonna um put to you now i had a, a little message earlier on let me just uh, try and i'm trying to find the exact wording um for it okay. but um uh yeah um somebody wants to remain anonymous and asked a kind of a sensitive question um okay. and I, um so I'll, I'll just i'll just uh try and uh phrase it in the, in the right way uh we, we know this is affecting quite a lot of people quite badly and uh, and somebody's asked a question here that says why do people commit suicide if god will never push us too far why do people commit suicide if God will never push us too far? That's a big question. It's a very big question. And, um, you know, I, uh, I'll do my best to answer it from the scriptures. Um, I, am, I imagine, I hope it's not related to these current things and is more a general question. Um, but if it is um, something that you're struggling with, whoever's asked that, I would suggest you, you reach out to somebody and that you trust, you know, that, that you can talk to about. However, um, let me just try and give you an answer from the Bible as best I can. I think the, ra the passage you reference, um, let me just think about this. It's the one uh, God will not. Oh, yeah, I think it's 1 Corinthians 10. In fact, let's just go over to 1 Corinthians 10. Um, I think it's there. I've got it right. Um, 1 Corinthians 10. Let me just see. And verse... Uh, Verse 13, I think, I imagine this is the one that's being referred to when it says God will not push you too far. And it, it's quite a comfort, actually, this verse. So it's great that we turn to it. 1 Corinthians 10, uh, verse 13 says, There hath no temptation or trial or, um, or pressure uh, taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able but will with temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. And so I think therein actually lies the answer to the question, which is that, yes, we are under trial. And, you know, the life of the believer is, is not easy. You know, um, through much tribulation, we will enter the kingdom, we, re we read. 
But um, so we must be, we must expect trials. We must expect challenges. We must expect problems. It's how God works with us and chastens us and, and shapes us into how he wants. But sometimes those things can get really overbearing. And I think in those times, this verse is a comfort because it says God will not push us too far. And it says that he will always make a way of escape, right? Now, if we um, are in that really difficult place where we can't see that way of escape, I would say we need help from other people to try find it, from other believers. Um, but it will be there. And so we mustn't give in to these difficult um, situations. I might just, um, there's actually a verse that comes to mind. Just turn over to 1 Kings 19, because um, I think we've got a, a template in the Bible uh, for this feeling of despair, this feeling of, of anxiety, and this feeling of, of wanting to, to end everything, right? Because it's a na- I think it's a natural thing when the trials get so much and we can't see that way out, we can't see that escape, you know, is that God's fault? God has, has promised that he's going to provide us a way of escape. So we've got to look for it. That's our job. But sometimes it's obscure. We can't see it. Now, it's a little bit slightly different because um, we're going in here to Elijah and he is he's in despair. And it feels like he's um, he was a very godly man. And we read in, uh, let me just see, in 1 Kings 19, we read in verse 4. You remember, he tries to revive Israel back to God, right? And um uh, and he's on Mount Carmel in chapter 18, and he there's a great uh, miracle that happens. And then in chapter 19, it, nothing seems to have changed within Israel. Jezebel, the evil uh, queen, is still prevalent. And so Jeremiah, uh, Elijah can't cope with it. In verse 4, he, 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 he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, came and sat down under a juniper tree and requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. And so we have that feeling of anxiety, right? And and the same has happened to many faithful people. You think of Job. Job thought this as well. So it's not a unnatural thing in a way to think of. But but what we've got to do is we've got to look for that way out. And it's interesting that in this circumstance in uh, with Elijah, that this angel appears, helps Elijah to eat, and uh, has a conversation with. Uh, Elijah and clearly doesn't want Elijah to end his life right that's clearly not a thing life is precious life is a gift we're made in the image of God we know this Um, and so we uh, are you know all that's asked of us is to is to serve God with the life that he's given to us and ending it is not the answer and the answer is to find the way of escape and you know what's really interesting here is that uh, let me just see in verse 12 you know what happens Um, well in fact if you look from verse 9 onwards um, God um, reveals himself to Elijah and makes him realize how small he is. He doesn't understand all the things that are going on. And there's this great uh, earthquake and great wind. And it says God wasn't in all of those great and pressure and scary things. God was not in those things. Where was God? It says in verse 12, after the fire, a still small voice. And it's that that I think we have to listen for uh, when things feel too much. We've got to get back to the still small voice, which is, of course, is God's word and, and look for the way of escape. And it's not easy. And I, and I don't know the circumstances you're in, but I hope those things may be of, in, of some help to you. So have a read of 1 Kings 19 a little bit more and definitely look again at uh, 1 Corinthians 10 because you can get a way out. You don't need to, to give in um, to those promptings of the flesh to end everything because God has got a purpose with us and there is more to, to do. One other sort of small thing is, is that I think um, when we start feeling like that, um, often we come become very inward and, be, and look at ourselves and feel very sorry for ourselves. And this is what happens with Elijah. This is what happens with Job. Um, but, but what are we told to do? We're told to serve each other, right? That's what we need to do. And so one thing that I found quite helpful when I've had uh, difficulties and stress is to, is to look outside of myself and to see how I might help others in some small way. And in doing that, you kind of um, your your brain kind of gets a bit of a rest, but it is a problem and it is an affliction. You know, stress, anxiety, depression, and I under, understand it. And uh, I think um, I think uh, you know it's it's just important to to hang on to that verse. All things work together for good to those that love God and don't give up on those things. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for that. Um, we've got another question that's uh, come via uh, one of the the YouTube channels we're going out on tonight. Uh, from somebody called Healthy American. 
Uh, and uh, the question is, why do people claim a pre-tribulation rapture when that's not in the Bible? Jesus tells us in Matthew 24, verses 15 to 30, that before he returns, he will see the abomination of desolation and great tribulation. Quite okay, a big how question there, Matt. So. <laughs> Um, I'd have to unpack a lot of that stuff. The I'll, first I'll thing again, if you want me to. Yeah, no, no. I think I think I can see. I think I can see it on the screen, which is oh, quite great. Okay. Um, I mean, it's it's tricky to know how to deal with this because um, in Matthew twenty four, Christadelphians, there's different there's different viewpoints in the Christadelphian community. But let's just go over to Matthew twenty four briefly. Um, one of our well, our founder John Thomas um, wrote a lot about the Olivet Prophecy in Matthew 24, and related it a lot to, and I, I happen to agree with this, to the last days of Judah's commonwealth um, and the, the destruction of the Jewish order of things, the Jewish heavens and the earth, as it's called in the scripture symbolically, of the, the ruling powers and the common people. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, you know, uh, I believe that, uh, that it has actually been finished and is complete and uh, has, has been fulfilled. So, for example, we read of um, lots of things there, really. I mean, you, you know, it's quite clear it's talking about uh, Jesus. Uh, and, sorry, um, the, 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 the powers. That, sorry, it's very clear that Jesus is talking about the powers of the Romans and AD 70 and the destruction of Israel, particularly at the beginning of the chapter. Um, so, for example, verse 15, when you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place. And we believe that that's talking about the Roman armies um let then let them which be in the judea flee into the mountains and so it's very much talking about the jews in that time were to flee and jesus warns them to flee um and so it, it goes on there shall be many false prophets verse 25 uh, but don't be deceived and so the disciples were to flee um and uh when we come on to verse 29 then well, it, it, it sort of explains that immediately after the tribulation of those days, so it's talking immediately after those days, various things happen in the political heavens um, and the earth. Now, this is a whole class in itself, to be frank, but I just mention it because it would seem that this is very much talking about AD 70 and the destruction of, um, of Jerusalem. So that's my kind of position on, on Matthew 24. Why do people say that there's a pre-tribulation rapture when that's not in the Bible? Well, the rapture verses are in, um, are in uh, Thessalonians. So perhaps we could go over to Thessalonians. Uh, I just need to remind myself of that. By the way, Brother Jared uh, should have probably mentioned, like, you know, caveat, Matt Davies doesn't know everything, right? So um, I'll probably have some thoughts time. after yeah. <laughs> we'll do what, we'll do what we can to answer what we well, can. We're trying to work it out, aren't we? So um, let me just find the rapture passages. Um, by the way, the word rapture I don't think is scriptural. I think that's the the Latin um, for, uh, for for being caught away. Um, let me just have a look. Yes, so it's one Thessalonians four, and it's talking about in uh, in verse thirteen. Um, the Apostle Paul, by inspiration, is writing to the Thessalonians and he's saying to them, look, you know, don't sorrow like people who don't have any hope to the hopeless. And this is the thing. When you're a believer, when you have the faith, when you understand the gospel and the coming kingdom and the resurrection, when um, if even if we die, we believe that that for us, really, the next moment is to be with Jesus and that coming kingdom. And that's our hope. And so he says, don't don't mourn like people that don't have a hope in verse 13. And he says, don't mourn because did you know basically that when Jesus returns, they're going to be raised and be with him before we are, you know, before those that are alive and remain. So what's, what the sequence is when you read this from verse 13 to 18 is that um, verse 16, for example, the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So step one, the dead rise, they go to be with Christ. Then we which are alive and remain, verse 17, go to be with them. Um, and this just is talking as if we're all, um, as if everybody's accepted at the judgment seat, then we'll be with Christ and remain with him uh, alive forevermore. Now, 
the the if you actually pick it apart though where it gets uh, interesting is in verse um, 17 which says then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the lord and a lot of christian groups i know make a great deal of that verse but let me just explain a couple of things firstly where it says caught up at least in my king james version um, the word just means snatched away. In fact, I think, if I can see my notes correctly, there's a passage in Acts. I think it's Acts 8, if I can see my note correctly. Acts 8, I think that says, I can't read my own handwriting, verse 29. But it's when Philip um, is caught away from the Ethiopian eunuch. It's the same word, right? And uh, what's really interesting is it doesn't denote going up. See, Philip was snatched away to another part of the world. And so what we, we have there is being caught away. So what it's saying is, is we that are alive and remain, we're going to be snatched away from everyday life to be with Christ, to be uh, gathered to him for judgment, we believe. It says, though, that we're going to meet with him in the clouds. Now, again, you know, this is enigmatic. One thing is that it literally means the clouds, but perhaps it's using symbolic language because in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1, after the, uh, the description of Hebrews 11, all the faithful people, we read that they are, uh, it says, we're clothed about with a great cloud of witnesses. So a cloud in scripture actually denotes a group of faithful people. And when you go into Revelation, when you go into Daniel, you see that the cloud is used in symbolic form to represent a group of people. So again, it doesn't, may not really mean that we're, we're hovering in, in heaven. When it says the air, yeah, I accept that that does mean the air. But as I've mentioned, you know, symbolically speaking, we have the political heavens and the earth, the common people. So again, um, Christadelphians would, would, would point to that to say, look, it doesn't mean this pre-rapture um, before everything's destroyed. In fact, we don't believe the earth will be destroyed. We believe God's purpose is with the earth and that it will, will remain. And that the passages about the destruction of the earth, particularly in Peter, for example, if you look at those carefully, are symbolic language. And it's talking again about the destruction of the heavens and the earth in AD 70. That's what we believe. We believe God's purpose is eternal with the earth. So that's my rough answer. I'm happy to uh, to dialogue with anybody about that if, uh, if if they want further information. Yeah, we're, uh, we're getting a few more questions coming in now, Matt. I'm going to give you uh, a couple more. I think, I, I mean, I'm, I'm very conscious that you've been speaking for a, a good hour and then... Uh, uh, I'm all right. Keep them coming. coming. Bit, but, uh, yeah, but I, <laughs> I think you, might, <laughs> you might get in trouble with the wife and, you know, I, I don't want to... Uh, oh, I'm always in trouble with the wife, Jared. Don't worry well, about that. I, I, I've been there. <laughs> been there. Uh, okay, another question here from uh, Rhonda Gallant. Uh, thanks for your Hi, question, Rhonda. Rhonda. Uh, do you see a connection with laws pertaining to leprosy in the Old Testament and our isolation at the moment? question mark being in isolation for 14 days i think that's really interesting isn't it god was there first right god knew that that was a good time to be isolated so do i see a connection um only in that it's 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 medically a good thing to do so god was and the law was far more advanced than um you know a lot of the other sort of medical ideas around you know we were bleeding people in 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 europe you know right up until the 1800s you know, and God's here and God's given us a, a law, which actually also teaches us, remember the law, the purpose of the law was to teach us about Christ. And when you come across leprosy, it's all about sin and it's the virus of sin, right? And that's kind of, that does remind us of the situation we're in now. So what we're facing is a little cameo. It should remind us, shouldn't it, of, of sin. That's what we were trying to say this evening and think about our response to this, to, to these things in the light of, of what God has put together. Okay, uh, thanks for that. Um, I've got another one on the screen. If I can just put my finger on it. Um, boom, boom, boom. Right, okay, a couple of questions here. Um, uh, one from, uh, if I can pronounce uh, this name correctly, uh, Peda Shields, maybe? I'm probably not saying that correctly, so apologies for that. But uh, um, We know that Image is coming together through the EU. However, the Bible seems silent on Ireland in general. Does prophecy thus require Ireland to not be part of the invading force in World War Three? Oh, well, hi, Peter. I'm, I'm sure I recently um, sent an email to somebody about this. So um, 
if it was you, um, hello. <laughs> if it wasn't, I'll try and look at this. So Ireland's an interesting one. Um, Ireland in Bible prophecy. Somebody asked me literally a couple of weeks about this, ago about this. Is Ireland in there? And um, the truth is, is that I, I don't know. I don't know. It, it, we don't. Ha we all we have mentioned is that uh, the nations mentioned in Ezekiel 38. We also have the the image of Daniel 2, which stands together that you referenced there. The image is coming together because in Daniel 2, you'll we'll know that all the that all the the metals which represented different kingdoms down through time. Um, uh, in Nebuchadnezzar's image, the great prophecy of Daniel 2, they're all destroyed together. And so we make the connection that somehow they're all connected, all these territories, all these cultures, all these people, even though they're historical. When Daniel sees it, they're all together and stood up. And uh, so they've got a history, but but the, the thing that's revealed is that when they're all together, that's when the stone hits. And so there's it's it's difficult, though, to know exactly where Ireland fits in. Um, Ireland is traditionally Catholic, right? And uh, when you go to Revelation 17, we meant we 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 know that um, the the harlot woman, the uh, the church, which we believe has gone astray, sadly, is there with the nations of the beast, and we believe that's a reference to Europe uh, in that day. So whether Ireland is part of that, it would probably seem likely, but I can't point you to one verse and say Ireland is definitely there. Um, so I would suspect yes. I would suspect Ireland, because of the connection to Catholicism, will be part, very much part of the beast system. But I cannot definitively uh, give you a verse. So that's my honest answer. Thanks so much. Um, OK, uh, I think I've got the right question with the right uh, actual person that posed the question for the last one. The next one, I think, comes from uh, Moose Grover, although it might not be from Moose Grover. It might be from uh, Michelle Parker. I'm not entirely sure. So apologies if, if I'm misreading this here. Great name, Moose Grover. It is pretty good. It's not uh, Grover. It's Grover. It's Grover. No, no, you're right. It's Grover. OK, there you go. Great name. I like that. I wish I was okay. um, <laughs> Do you think Corona is linked to the pestilence spoken of in Revelation chapter 6? OK, let's have a look at Revelation 6. <clears throat> so the four horsemen of the apocalypse right again a tricky subject and we could probably spend two evenings on on revelation just before we go to revelation six i think the first thing to, to note about revelation always whenever anyone takes me to revelation or suggests anything to revelation i always make sure that we have just covered off revelation one verse one because it's so important that we get the right perspective, right? So Revelation 1 verse 1 says that the book of Revelation was given by God um, to Jesus to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And it says he sent and signified it by an angel unto his servant John. So the first thing to note is that this work was signified. The word means encoded. It was kind of codified. So this is a book of symbol. So when we read of a lamb, it's not really a lamb. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. When we read of heavens, it's not really the heaven that we can see where the birds fly. It's the political heavens. When we read of a throne, it's not a literal throne. There's lots of things in the book of Revelation, all of them. When we read of a woman, it's not a real woman. It's a symbolic woman, a beast and someone and so forth. So that's the first thing that to, to mention. Now, when we, when we look at um, Revelation chapter 6, which is where this comes in at, the book of Revelation actually, interestingly, I believe, is continual historic, which means that it's to show unto the, to, to John things that would begin to come to pass uh, right the way down through time. And we are actually in Revelation 16 in our time in what's called the sixth vial. And we know that because of the drying up of the river Euphrates, which refers to the power in control of the Euphrates, which was Turkey, which happened in World War One. So we are there. And the next thing to happen in Revelation 16 is is the Armageddon and the Battle of the Nations. But that's by and by. We're talking here in Revelation 6. Now, in Revelation 6, we have a number of um, seals which are opened, which are punishments um, on, um, on, the, on, the, on basically, I believe, on pagan Rome. OK, so when you go through Revelation 6, um, it's very interesting because um, we have all these seals opened. And I, as I say, it's a kind of a study in its own right. And you have to go into history. But what's remarkable is that each of the symbols in each of these four horsemen that are unleashed by each seal 
it, you can pattern to Roman history down through time. So, uh, and they fit perfectly. So, for example, the white horse, which um, which we believe um, references kind of this period of um, of peace because it's white and it references peace. There's various other symbols in there. We would say it actually aligns very much to what happened with Commodus, the Roman emperor, right? And so, what I'm trying to say to you is, is that I don't think that the pestilences mentioned, which I believe are in um, the um, Where's the where's the poorly horse? Uh, it's the oh, black horse. horse. Is it the black horse? Um, You're getting a lot of feedback at the moment, Matt. I don't know whether that's um, you're hearing that, but um, oh no, I'm not. Sorry, sorry. I don't know if, uh, is that a bit better? No? Uh, I've got nothing here. I don't know. Um, it's coming from somewhere, but uh, it's very strange. Is it still there? Yeah, a bit, a, a bit. I'm hearing it. I hope everybody else can hear it okay, but uh, I'm hearing a bit. But, uh, but we'll, I, haven't, okay. I haven't got anything happening here. Sorry. Sorry. Um, I'm just trying to find this uh, pestilence mentioned. I think it's the pale horse. There's a pale horse anyway that, that's there. His name was Death and Hell followed with him. Um, and uh, basically um, the various things happen. And then the, that, that was in verse 8. But there's another horse in verse 5, the black horse, with a pair of balances. So I, I can't see the pestilence. Is it, can anyone else see it? Can anyone put, a chat, put it in the chat? Am I too loud again? I'll just turn myself down. I don't know. But, uh, I don't know whether, 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 when, if I'm talking, you're hearing bad feedback coming through, but um, I'm, I'm hearing a bit, a bit of feedback on, on your line. I don't know why, I don't know why that is. But, uh, um, so, yeah. You know, so, uh, say, the pale horse, the, the pale horse and his name that sat on him was death. Is that, the, is that what you're thinking of? Yeah, I think that must be what the questioner had in mind. Um, but just on that front, um, the various sources represent various phases in the pagan Roman history. We believe in the continuing historic interpretation. If you look up um, Christadelphians continuing historic, there's a great verse by verse exposition, exposition by H.P. Mansfield, who is an Australian Christadelphian. Um, we call him verse by verse purse. So um, you might find some good stuff in uh, the exposition of Revelation, I think it's called, or the Exposition of the Apocalypse. Apocalypse Epitomized, I think it's called. Apocalypse Epitomized by H.P. Mansfield. Have a look through that, and uh, that will give you a gist, and I'm more than happy to talk to you about that. Another book um, that you might find helpful is a book by um, a Christadelphian called Robert Roberts, and it's called 13 Lectures, and he'll have a whole chapter, I believe, on Revelation chapter 6 in there, which I would recommend you have a flick through. Um, if you're interested in the four horses of the apocalypse. But thank you for the question, and I hope that, that went some way to answer. Thanks, Matt. Um, the, the line's really good now, so there's no feedback coming through, which is good. So um, I've got one more question here, um, and I think this might be our final question, but um, I will have a quick look. Um, and I think this one might be a question from uh, Michelle Parker. And the question is, I'll, I'll read it exactly as it's worded. Uh, when Christ reigned for a thousand years... Where will the saints be at that time, and can you speak to the elect? Um, give me a second. So, in the thousand-year period, um, that's mentioned in uh, Revelation 20, right? So, we might just want to flip to Revelation 20. So what we believe as Christadelphians and Bible believers, as the questioner seems to indicate, is that when Jesus returns, he establishes the kingdom and there's a thousand year period. And um, and uh, basically at the end of the thousand year period, there's another resurrection and judgment of the people that lived within that thousand year block. And at the end of that, in 1 Corinthians 15, we read that God will be all in all. And we believe that it's at the end of that time, the end of the kingdom, the thousand year kingdom, that um, that the the earth will be filled with the glory of God, as we mentioned, and, and the whole earth will be populated with immortal people. And so Revelation 20 references these thousand years. It's interesting, Revelation is a book of symbol, right? But this is the only time we get this definitive year, uh, thousand years mentioned. So so we take it um, because that seems to be the very the very essence of the message. It's going to be a thousand years. And we read that sin, basically, referenced in verse two, is suppressed for that thousand years. So where will Christ and the saints be? Well, when you go through the whole of the book of Revelation, it talks, doesn't it, very much about them reigning as kings and priests with Christ on the earth. Let me just, um, let me give you some, give you, give you some passages to, uh, to help with that. So, um, 
we read, for example, in Revelation 1, verse 6, that, uh, that, that the saints had been made kings and priests unto God and his Father, to be, uh, and they would be glory and dominion forever and ever to them. And in Revelation 5, verse 10, the glorified saints again, um, they will be kings and priests, and they shall reign on the earth. So that's why Christadelphians very much believe that this idea of the rapture and the earth burning up and blowing up and, uh, and all of that can't mean what uh, a lot of mainstream Christianity says that it means because they're going to reign on the earth, right? The kingdom is going to be restored to Israel. Jesus is going to sit on the throne of his father, David. And with that in mind, where was that throne? Well, it was in Jerusalem. And so we believe the epicenter of the kingdom will be at Jerusalem. So we believe that that's where Christ will be on his throne. And we read in the back end of the book of Ezekiel of a temple being built that all the nations of the world will come to. And a law going out from Zion, we read of in Isaiah 2, to the nations. And so it would seem, although we don't know precisely where every single accepted saint might be, but it would seem the work of the saints is to very much help Christ rule in that in that in that millennial period and to bring the nations to worship God um, and keep the law, the Torah uh, that will go forth from Zion in Isaiah chapter two. Um, and there's diff- various indications of what happens, like, for example, um, in the back end of Zechariah 14, for example, we have reference to the nations keeping the Feast of Tabernacles. So it seems that parts of the old law will be reinstituted for humanity to learn of learn of sin And instead of it pointing forward to the things of Jesus, it would appear that the law will, in fact, point back to what Jesus had accomplished to help teach people about uh, about sin. So I don't know if that helps to answer your question, but it seems that the 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 um, the glory of that future age will very much um, be uh, given to the saints so that they can rule and be part of the throne and be part of the rulership of the kingdom as immortal beings in their political heavens in the in the leadership roles and on the earth there'll be a mortal population which will be um which will be in subjection to the lord jesus christ and he'll have dominion over them so i hope that helps well thanks a lot matt um i think we'll uh, conclude uh, the questions uh, there i don't think we've got any more that i can see but um if anybody has any uh, uh, questions that come to mind in the next uh, days, weeks, and months, and there's a whole range of ways they can get in touch with the Christadelphians uh, local to where they are, um, and of course online. Now, what I'm going to try and do, if I can press the right button here, is uh, just screen share one of the ways you can get in touch uh, with um, uh, the live Christadelphians. I think uh, hopefully be able to see a little bit of what I've got here. Yeah, wait a minute. I'm going to cancel that. That's the wrong bit. Uh, so. Um, Okay, so um, if you've got any questions or comments you'd like to send through to us, um, our website here at Lie is lieecclesia at gmail.com. Uh, and you can visit our website at liechristadelphians.co.uk. Uh, so that's lieecclesia at gmail.com uh, or uh, liechristadelphians.co.uk. Uh, thanks again, uh, Matt, for your work this evening. And thanks to all those behind the scenes who've been working as well to get this online. And uh, I think uh, you've earned yourself a, a well-earned break. So uh, I want to thank everyone for tuning in tonight and uh, uh, ask uh, God to bless you all and uh, as, you, as you read his word and hopefully uh, learn more of his plan and purpose with mankind. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Gerard. God bless. Thanks. Thanks. Good night. God bless.